So Sue, uh, Sue Edge lives in town, and she's she's very very much into history. And you work at a, a nursing home, correct? Retirement community. Retirement community. Not nursing. Home. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and she likes to entertain um, the residents there with presentations a lot about history. And she's put together this presentation a long time ago, right? You've had it for in the fall. Six months or so. Yeah. And. We wanted to, this, a lot of people that know a little bit about the Pine Tree Riot, some people know everything. Some people uh, might have been there, I don't know. <laughs> um, but a lot of people say, yeah, I know a little bit about it, but I don't know much. So we wanted to create an opportunity for people to, to get all the information they can and sort of appreciate it even more. Um, and we hope to do that on the 9th as well. Plenty of seats in the middle here. So Sue is going to go through her presentation. We're all in a retirement community here. We'll pretend that we're her. Oh, I don't residents. know about that. They're very <laughs> kind to me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a good it's a good presentation. A lot of pictures that she just talks to along the way. So not a lot of facts and figures to date. So there are some, but it's a story, and uh, and Sue tells it very well. So I'll hand <coughs> it off to Sue. Thanks for coming, everyone. So, um, sorry it's so small, we couldn't figure out where all the stuff was in here and how it all works. So, I hope you can see the screen okay, and I'm assuming you can all hear me okay? Good. I usually don't have a problem being heard, so, uh, but I am, if you don't mind, going to sit while I present, just because I don't have a long enough cord to raise my laptop up high enough. Um, so let's get started with what is the Pine Tree Riot. Originally when I did this, I kind of made it really personal um, when I shared it with the residents because I joined the 250th committee for the Pine Tree Riot. And I said, oh, well, I need to learn some stuff, so why don't I do a presentation for the history club that I run with my residents. So I had my turn, I think November maybe, October last year. And so I had it a little more personal because I had maps and I had my house pointed out and a picture of my great-great-grandfather. And um, so I took most of that out just so you wouldn't be bored out of your mind and I hope you're not bored. So let's just get started. Um, and we're going to try to answer what is the Pine Tree Riot. Um, which wasn't my original question, but Tom decided that's what we were going to do, so that's what we're doing. And he's going to step in where he feels he needs to. So uh, back in the day when I was younger, um, the town folks, uh, well, back way back in the day, before I was younger, um, in a nutshell, people of town didn't want to give up their pine trees. They didn't want to um, give them up to the Royal Navy. So um, they did it. So guy comes to town, says he's going to collect the fine. They beat him up. And the story I always heard as a kid was that they tarred and feathered him. Even when talking with my stepbrother about this, he goes, oh, they tarred and feathered him. I said, well, that's the tall tale. They didn't really do that. <coughs> so we're going to answer the question, what is the Pine Tree Riot? Um, this particular cartoon actually references the Boston Tea Party that you can see over in the corner. But the purpose of it is to show what tar and feathering might have looked like. So before we can answer the what, we're going to tell you um, where, when, why, and who. So we'll start with where. We all live in where. We've all heard the jokes. How many of you said someone asked where do you live? You say where. They say where. You're like, yeah, that's original. Yeah. Um, I grew up in Northware, so that's nowhere. I now live in Southware, so where. And um, I used to actually live in Eastware, but not the old Air Eastware village, that's the flood zone, but the close to that. But uh, my mom actually did grow up in Eastware, but no one ever said Eware, because that's just not as funny. <laughs> so um, the town of Ware is located, as you know, in Hillsborough County. 
It's 57 square miles. It's the largest town in area in Hillsborough County. And the dot there shows where we're located. So the town has many names before it became Ware. Um, it goes something like this. First in 1735, Beverly, Canada, later called Hailstown after Robert Hale, and then it was known as Robbie's Town after um, Ichabod Rod Robbie's. In 1745, after New Hampshire became separate Providence, and considerable part of the territory had still not been settled. Um, as a result, that was rebranded to petitioners from Bedford, Hampton, and other boundary towns under the name of Ware's Town after Meshach Ware. And I think a few of us say that a little different. I was just asking someone how they say it, and they said Meshach. I say Meshach, but I heard Sherry say it a different way. Sherry, how do you say it? Meshach. Oh, Meshach. Okay. I thought I heard it less of a k at the end. And um, Meshach Ware was also served as the first governor of the state. In 1764, it was incorporated under the present name Ware, in, in Meshach Ware's honor. And there is lots of town history, um, but we're not going to get into that tonight. We're just trying to answer the question, what is Pine Right. So we're going to move on to the when, and so we're going to take uh, some time to talk about life in New Hampshire in 1772. It didn't look like this in New Hampshire in 1772, but it did in Pennsylvania. This is Independence Hall, it's quite civilized, with beautiful buildings, society, and wealth. Even Boston, Massachusetts was quite developed, only 80 years after the infamous Salem witch trials that took place just north of Boston. Um, it was bustling with activity, busy streets around the state house, which was built in 17. Uh, 48. So you can see that New Hampshire is not very populated and just 50 years prior to this picture there were no dots in New Hampshire. So um, in 1772 we can assume that there wasn't much civilization and development in where. People were homesteading, building cabins, developing their land um, to make it suitable for farming, which means making fields, pulling out stumps of felled trees, plowing, and of course, pulling up stumps. It is the Grand State, and any of you that have gardened and where know that we spend <laughs> half of our time picking out rocks and boulders from the ground. It seems like they just keep on growing. And you also have to remember, no tractors, machinery, Maybe not even oxen or animals to help do the work. It was all real manual labor. I don't even think they had decent hoes, probably. It's probably safe to assume, too, that daily life for women was different than daily life for men. There was no social society. Fabric was very expensive. And it wasn't until about the 1770s that homespun fabrics began to be made Prior to this time, it was all imported. In fact, there was quite a few laws similar to the pine tree business um, that you couldn't even make your own homespun. You had to import and buy everything. So um, the women, they wore a shift, which was the undergarment. Um, they had stockings that they actually had to tie on with ribbon or garter. Uh, most of them were a bone, a uh, whalebone stay, which I'm, I'm told from what I've researched that it's much more comfortable than it looks. I don't know as though I would want to be tied into that, but apparently it helps hold up petticoats and whatever else needs holding up. Um, they had pockets that were actually separate that were tied on. Um, petticoats were often made of cotton, and then a second petticoat might have been more decorative, possibly linen or wool. In an outer dress, um, which was known as an English gown, which um, were open in the front and fastened to a stomacher, which was actually a 
separate piece of fabric that they kind of pinned on and then they pinned their dress on to that. Um, and then a handkerchief to add modesty, for modesty to cover the chest. And lastly, an apron. And of course, their head was covered with a cap and their shoes were often just the buckle shoe with that wide little heel. I know, probably most of you aren't interested in that, but I think it's super cute, so I had to include it. So, um, back in where, this is uh, looking down, uh, going south on Route 114. The mountain ranges of Wallingford, Mount William, and Mount Dearborn can be seen. Beyond that would be the Ankununiks and Goffstown. Um, this picture actually came from the, um, the Ware history. I actually have one of the original ones that I took from my mom because she had two others. So now that was mine. Um, and uh, that was published in 1888 by William Little. But we're going to keep traveling to 114, which obviously it wasn't called that in 1772. Does anyone know what it was called in 1772? The main road through where? I'm not answering that question because I don't know. I just didn't know if anybody else did. <laughs> um, so we're going to go over um, Mount William. And how many travel Mount William to commute? I do. Not a fun road. I can't even imagine what it would have been like then, especially in the winter. So we're going to move on to why. Well, this is why. These guys, really big trees, tall, straight. Um, you can see some of these pine trees actually in Bradford. This is in Bradford just last weekend. That's me hiding behind that tree. I'm really not hiding. I'm just trying to give it a hug. So you cannot see my other hand. So that's just to tell you how big the trees were around here during this time. These little trees though were just saplings when uh, during the revolution. So King William and Queen Mary in granting the lands in America in 1690 reserved all white pine trees above 24 inches in diameter, fit for masting the Royal Navy. Later in 1722, King George I enacted a law making it a penal offense to cut white pine trees in the King's province without um, His Majesty's royal license. But the law changed from 24 inches to 12 inches, and the fines were steep. Five pounds for every tree from 12 inches and under, 10 pounds from 12 to 18 inches, 20 pounds for 18 to 24 inches, and 50 pounds for um, 24 inches or over. And all the lumber made from these trees was forfeited to the king. Um, if the offender did not pay their fine, then um, he was put in prison and kept there until His Majesty's officers, officers should see fit to let him out. So when these um, trees were milled, the boards were really big. And Tom is going to talk about the board feet. So you're up. Let me, let me just throw a couple points at you, too, just for context. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the late 1600s, when people started coming over here after, after Mayflower, and more and more people started coming, England was pretty much deforested at that time. They had used up all their trees, right? They had a pretty massive navy. Everything was made out of wood, right? I mean, there was a lot of oak, but the, the pine trees were used for the masts, both uh, the mast vertical ones and the horizontal ones. I don't know all the proper names for those, but um, they, they saw the new world as a resource rich area. I mean, so that sets the stage. And they were in charge, right? Everybody here was English, right? It, was, it wasn't Americans, it was, the, it was their land. They, they had taken it from the French and they had gone through the French and Indian Wars. Uh, Indians were gone, almost gone, the French were out, and it belonged to England. And they needed, they needed wood and they needed resources. The other thing I want to point out is that the French and Indian War was expensive, like all wars, they're expensive. And the British needed money after that to pay for that. And the resources that were in this, in this New England area provided them with revenue. So that's, that's uh, another kind of undercurrent to what was going on. Um, the, uh, Sue mentioned that from the very beginning, the British government 
the crown basically put all the trees 24 inches and above off limits. You had to have somebody come out and mark all the trees on your property that weren't yours to touch. And then you had to pay taxes on all the other ones that you could touch. So it was kind of a double hit. This is, this is about what a 24 inch tree looks like. So it's pretty big. Everything bigger than this was off limits. And as you can see on there, there's a number 378 for a 24 inch tree. 378 board feet. That's about, that's the, if you cut boards on, on a 10 feet long slice of this, 24 inches round. If you cut in a mill all the boards, the boards at the beginning are smaller and then they get bigger towards the middle and then they get smaller again. If you add up all the board feet of what you get out of that, on a 10 foot length you get about 378 board feet. And that's according to something called Blodgett's rule. Blodgett was, um, Sue's going to talk a little bit about Samuel Blodgett. He was a bit of a turncoat, but uh, you know he was, he was in the timber business and he came up with, that, with the formula for calculating the board feet of a 10 foot length or any length by any diameter. 378 is what you got. In 1722, and nobody really paid attention to that 24 inch rule. Nobody really enforced it. I think the British got the trees that they wanted. People, got, people took their trees, but there was really no penalty for the most part. Well, the British started realizing that the wood was starting to go fast and they needed more. And they dropped the rule from 24 to 12. So anything this size or greater was off limits on your property now. And remember, 378 dropped to 95. So it's a half of a diameter change, but that's only a quarter of the board feet that you got out of that, 25%. So you lost 75% of all the wood on your property that you owned, effectively, which technically you really didn't. The British government owned it. But people say 24 to 12, you don't really think of that as a big deal. But when you see 378 to 95, that's a big deal. That's your livelihood right there. And as Sue said, timber and farming are the two biggest um, economic forces here. And uh, you take away 75% away of somebody's timber of what they could use, that's, that's a big deal. So you can understand why they got a little, a little angry. Okay, Sue. So this is just an example of boards from a, a house that's actually in Ware. This house was built in 1790. So um, it's after all of this takes place. So the trees, uh, the owners that, that built this house and built this um, lumber, the, this milled this um, boards didn't have to pay the fines. But this is from a house in Ware, 1790. So what are the masts used for? Well, this is the best example that I could come up with. Um, and for about 80 years, um, before the revolution started, all of the timber provided for these ships came from America. I've never seen one, I don't think, that I could relate to, to say, that was a full tree. So next time you see the tall ships, if they ever come to town, not our town, but um, go see them. And then you can say, oh, that's why they wanted those. So now we're going to talk about who. Governor Benning Wentworth wrote into the charter for where um, the usual provisions, the white pine trees, for the white pine trees that said, always reserving to us, our heirs and successors, all white pines that are or shall be found growing or being on the said tract of land fit for the use of the Royal Navy. So, but under his rule, it wasn't rigorously enforced. Um, in the new towns, little attention was paid to it. In the old, older towns, just enough attention was paid to keep the, the king supplied with masks. But when Governor Benning Wentworth resigned in 1766, his nephew John Wentworth um, was appointed governor and he enforced the mask um, law, being the new surveyor of the king's wood, woods. He soon um, saw that a generous revenue could be had from, white, from the white pine tree law. And um, he began at once collecting 
He appointed deputies in all uh, places where white pine um, trees grew. And he actually acted um, himself in many of the areas. And his favorite method um, with the surveyor and his deputies was to just visit the mill yards. And if they found any white pine logs, they put the broad arrow mark um, on them. And the, the, people, the mill workers, they just dared not even touch those logs. Uh, the new settlers, before they could even build their cabin and clear his land, he had to get a deputy to put the broad arrow um, mark um, on, on the trees. So before they even were able to finish up their own house, they maybe have gotten a roof on, chimney up, now they can't put any walls on their place. Just imagine what that would have been like. Made for some unhappy people, I think. So the law soon became very unpopular with all classes, not just the mill owners. They wanted the trees first to saw. Farmers wanted to build their houses. And ministers wanted to build nice new meeting houses. The logs seized were labeled to a vice ad admiralty court, and the owners were cited to come in by notice in some newspaper. Um, if they did not pay the large sum to settle, which was what the governor and his deputies most desired, the logs were sold at public auction. All proceeds after paying the cost were turned over to his majesty's treasury, and the offenders were fined. John Sherburne, a deputy, came to the area in the winter of 1771 to 1772. He found a large lot of white pine logs in, at many mills, including 270 at Clements Mill in Ware. He thought the trees from which they were cut were fit to be masks for the Royal Navy. They were at once labeled in the Vice Admiralty Court and advertised in the Portsmouth Gazette. And just on a side note, I didn't know what um, the Vice Admiralty Court is. I actually didn't even know how to pronounce it, so I had to do a how to pronounce thing. Have you ever tried that? It's pretty fun. Um, so assuming that maybe some of you don't know that either, it's actually a court where there's no jury and all the judges are appointed um, by the royalty. So they're not people that are, what do, how do I want to say it? Um, right, right. They were all appointed by royalty, meaning they were going to vote for the king, not for the people. Sometimes that still happens. So what happened was um, these offenders appeared in the Gazette in February 7, 1772 at Portsmouth. They were told to appear in court. Um, they were being cited to come in and show why they should not be fined. The mill owner sent Samuel Blodgett of Goffstown to Portsmouth to settle it for them. But when Blodgett went to Portsmouth, the governor won him over to his side on February 11, 1772, made him deputy of surveyor of the King's Woods. They, he gave him a long commission and a large territory to look after, and they agreed upon a settlement for the offenders with the logs given up and the cases would be dropped. Then Blodgett came home and he had to kind of make up a little bit of a story because those that hired him, he kind of <coughs> threw him under the bus, for lack of a better term. So what Blodgett did was he sent the offenders each a letter um, saying that it had been a disagreeable journey and the governor had made him deputy to put the law into force. He was reluctant to do anything unless obstinate and notorious offenders should compel him. He wrote that if they could call on him soon, he would make it easy for them. 
Three, three men from Bedford and 14 from Godstown came at once and settled. Consequently, the where men were labeled notorious offenders. Remembering the hateful taxes recently opposed and sympathizing with the attitude of the people of Portsmouth and Massachusetts, they decided to defy the king's men and refuse to pay any fines. The county sheriff, Benjamin Whiting, Esquire of Hollis, and his deputy, John Quigley, Esquire of Francistown, were charged with delivering warrants and making arrests in the king's name. This is a map that actually came from the Ware um, Junior Historical Society commemorative book. And I circled the areas where those key players lived. I don't know how well you can see it in the back, but if you have one of those books, you can look at it and it's, it's pretty neat. And um, let's see, number eight is right here. That's Ebenezer Merchant's house. And Aaron Quimby, the inn right there, both 114. 114 goes to the Whiting proceeded to Ware on April 13, 1772 with his deputy, John Quigley of Francistown, for Ebenezer Mudgett, the chief of the offenders who lived on the road just up from Clement's Mill, which, oops, let me back up, which is down here someplace. Not still there, but um, actually Tom drew a really nice map that you're gonna be able to get at the event so you can see where some of these sites are in where. So it was late in the day when they found him, and he said he would give bail the next morning. The sheriff and his deputy then went to Aaron Quimby's inn nearby for the night. This is the fun part. The news that the sheriff had come from Mudget um, spread like wildfire. Scores of men said they would come and bail him. They met at his house and made a plan how to give the bail. Mudgett went to the inn at dawn, burst into the room, awoke the sheriff and told him the bail was ready. Then more than 20 men rushed in, faces black, switches in hand to give bail. Whiting seized his pistol and would have shot some of them but they caught him, took away his guns, and held him by the arms and legs up from, from the floor, his face down. Two men on each side with their rods beat him to their heart's consent. <coughs> they crossed out the account against them of all the logs cut, drawn, and forfeited on his bare back. Much to his great discomfort and their delight. That is actually how it's written in the 1888 history. <laughs> I know, I laugh too. I love it. I'm gl so glad you're laughing. It's not that funny, but. <laughs> um, so, they, they, they made him wish he had never heard of pine trees fit for masting the Royal Navy. Quigley and his deputy showed fight so he was also uh, beaten. Even the horses were affected by having their ears cropped and manes and tails cut. They were allowed to mount their horses and leave with jeers, jokes, and shouts ringing in their ears from the townspeople. They were mad, said it was high-handed outrage and that they would give the wear men a dose of martial law. But the rioters fled to the woods and not a soul of them could be found. But Sheriff Whiting did not let the matter rest. One of the rioters was soon caught, put in jail. Um, the rest gave bail to come to court. Eight men were indicted. Using the same map, they were Timothy Worthy, Jonathan Worthy, K. 
Caleb Atwood, William Dustin, Abraham Johnson, Jotham Tuttle, William Quigley, and Ebenezer Budget. Mudget, sorry. They were charged with being rioters, disturbers of the peace, and with making an assault upon the body of Benjamin Whiting Esquire Sheriff, and that they beat, wounded, and evilly treated him. It wasn't until September that they were brought to court with one of the judges being the Honorable Meshach Ware. They were fined 20 shillings each. A very light fine. It seems that the court showed more sympathy for the men who cut the logs than for the sheriff in the very unpopular pine tree law. The pine tree law, as it was enforced, was more oppressive and offensive to the citizens of New Hampshire than the Stamp Act, the Sugar Act, and the imposed duty on tea. The only reason why the rebellion at Portsmouth and the Boston Tea Party were better known um, than the Pine Tree Riot is because possibly they had better historians. The Boston Tea Party took place on December 16, 1773. So what is the Pine Tree Riot? The where, when, and why, and who was answered. So hopefully you know now um, what the answer is to the what. And that's my great-grandfather, Clarence Leeds. This is actually a picture that's been floating around for a little while, and I actually have one of those pictures. And he's holding a cute little dog. I'm not sure you can see that. That's a mill near the site of Clements Mill, mm -hmm. right, where the logs were found? Um, is it nearby? It's one of them that was in. Yeah, it's close to the site of Clements Mill. Yeah. And that's the last slide, and we hope that you are able to join us um, on April 9th for our all-day events. It's uh, in a week from Saturday, actually. And um, there's going to be two showings of the play, The Pine Tree Riot, so you'll want to be able to plan your day out so you can see one of those. It's based on Connie Evans' book, um, and she's here. <laughs> You want to tell us anything about the show? It's great. It's great. <laughs> All of the people in the show are townspeople, and I've been watching um, some posts that are going up on the on the one of the Facebook um, groups that there is, and it looks like they're having a blast. So you I'm have to use excited. your imagination for the oxen and the horses. Just, <laughs> you don't have it. We it's couldn't culture. put any on the town um, hall stage. <laughs> I think we could probably do that. Outside the budget. So Tom is going to take some things uh, from here. Can you go back to the, uh, the flat detail for having? Oh, yes, I can. Thank you. 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 Thank and Thank you. 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 I kind of, for me, history is, it's, it's flat, it's on a piece of paper, but I like to see it three-dimensionally if I can. So I want to throw out a couple of thoughts just to, just to kind of add a little bit to the why, right? Because what, what these guys did was they, they really put their livelihood and, and their families at risk, really, by effectively beating up a, a king's sheriff and his deputy. You know, that's, that's a pretty big deal. You know, it's not a light task. Um, but, you know... New England and New Hampshire were basically England's uh, resource pool, right? They had to pay for wars, they had, they, they had lost all their trees, they cut them all down, and they taxed. There was a way to get revenue for, for the country, you know, for the, uh, the British Empire. We were a tax resource, really. To, we were being used by the, by the British government to generate revenue and, and take our resources. You know, the, the, spirit, the spirit of individuality was strong in New Hampshire and New England, and that kind of went against that. You know, you were a subject, you weren't an individual, and the British crown treated us like subjects. Um, th this flag uh, came out after the pine tree riot, but it, you, you might see it around. Uh, there's a couple of flags. A lot of flags had pine trees on them during the Revolutionary War, 
which, be which became like a symbol of independence and resilience and, and rebellion a little bit, right? It was, it was the American spirit was embodied in the pine tree. The Appeal to Heaven was commissioned by George Washington, and he put it on all the Navy, the U.S. Navy ships in the late 1700s, you know, revolutionary and after. And what it, what it really means is that, the, you know, the courts, the sheriffs, the judges, even the New Hampshire legislature at the time was all, they all worked for the king, right? New Hampshire was a, was a colony, really, just a, you know, a British colony, literally. And everything anybody in, in any power, position of power did was for the benefit of the king. That's how they got their job. That's how they kept their job. If they, if they didn't act that way, and if they acted on the, on the benefit of, of the average person, like Mudgett and Quimby's and, and, and Atwood's, they would lose their job. It was all, uh, what's, what's the word, patronage, right? They were given these jobs. And from the very beginning, the British kept tightening and tightening and tightening the screws on the colonies for the resources and for the taxes. And, it, and people realized that they, you know, they were not individuals, they were subjects. Um, appeal to heaven means when you, when you don't have the courts, you don't have the legislature, you don't even have the sheriff, you don't even have Mr. Blodgett anymore. He, he turned and, and took the money and run. You know, he, he took the patronage job when he went to advocate for these, for these uh, people that cut the trees. They had nothing. So uh, what appeal to heaven means is that's your only recourse is to, is to you know, appeal to the Almighty, whatever that happens to be to you, and that's all you have. And you have to kind of throw it up to chance, do what you think is right, and hope for the best. And that's really what the whole American Revolution was about. It was a big risk, and it almost failed a number of times. And people had faith, basically, to make it happen. And so George, that's why George Washington felt so strongly about that flag and that statement. Um, you know, it was a, it was a big risk, and it, and it was a, um, it, it was not a winning game. But in the end, look what happened. Um, and I, I think the one thing to remember is that if you look at a timeline of history here, the Pine Tree Riot is really like one or two of the first early acts of resistance against the British. And I think somebody said to me that the United States is the only, I don't know if it's true, but it sounds right, is the only British colony to actually fight for independence and win and become its own country. I don't, I don't know of any other colony that did that. It sounds like it's, like it's plausible truth. Um, and and look, what, look what happened as a result, right? The whole world changed because this country was formed. And the, if you look at the, the seed of, of, a, of a plant, of a garden, of bounty, you know, bounty of fruit, vegetables, those seeds you know, were the thing that started it all. And really, the Pine Tree Riot is that seed. Somebody dug a little hole, put the seed in the ground, and that was, you know, there were other acts that happened. It wasn't the only one, but it, it gave, it's, it is said that it gave the people at the Boston Tea Party an example of you, they did it and they got away with it. So, uh, and there, you know, there was a, another one in 1734 in Fremont or Exeter, Mass Tree Riot, which they actually fired shots uh, to run the surveyor off out of town. That was about 50 years before the Pine Tree Riot. So this is this was brewing and brewing. And you know, 17 months after the Pine Tree Riot was the Boston Tea Party, and then eventually William and Mary, the raid on William and Mary, another big one, that kept the snowball going. So I, I think you know th this act gets a lot of credit for it, as a seedling of the United States, you know, forming. I think we all know how how that turned out, how good it was. So I just I, I try I, I want people to think of that, and, and you know, it's not just a bunch of numbers. It's important to know the details, but. The context is, is, even, is even more important. So that's why I'm passionate about it. I think everybody else here is. Uh, and we happen to live in the town, and, you know, drive by that site every day. It's kind of a neat thing. So I hope you all can, can come on the 9th. And uh, if you're a descendant of any of the uh, Clement Mill owner or the eight, especially the eight uh, riders, um, when you come to the event, we're going to have a big tent. There's going to be seats for the first. 45 minutes, we're going to have a little, a little ceremony. Um, descendants can, should come right up to the front, and sit in the front row, and um, and you know you're our VIP guests for the day. So, um, oh, Betty, you have a question? <laughs>
And I don't know how many people in the room realize that all of this happened right down on Eastman Hill near yep. where. And that uh, millstone is on the uh, property that's not written now where out of where it is. Um, I it's the Avon, the Avon no, store. No, the Avon place is up the hill. Oh, up the hill. That's where it happened. Oh, yeah. That's where the inn was, where the Avon store is. Yep. And uh, there are two millstones there, one down in the residence of Ebenezer. Where Mudgeon lived. Where Mudgeon lived. Right. And the uh, other millstone is up on the property where the store is. Right. And it's Aaron Quimby's inn. Aaron Quimby, yep. And we're going to hand out a map <laughs> at the event. With a, we have a booklet that we made. We're, there's going to be a map in it that will show you where those two millstones are that Betty's talking about, and where the mill was, which was down in Riverdale. So those are the three key sites to the to the whole event. And uh, the map <coughs> will will help you if you want to drive out to those sites. You know, it'll be clear where they are. Um, Betty, did I miss anything? Anything you want to or correct me on anything? Because you're the historian. Well, didn't you miss? And I can remember as a kid going to Manchester, and if we came home at night, it was a little bit spooky to come through Riverdale because the mill at that point was deteriorating, mm. and uh, uh, that that picture is sort of the original mill, I think, and it didn't go out until flood of '38. Yeah, that picture was 1906, I think it says on the yeah. photo, right? So, yeah. Question in the back. Go ahead. Aline. Tom, um, do you have any place where you have the program listed so people know what time things are going on? Yeah, it's on the wherehistoricalsociety.org so website. So plays are going on and when the museum is open. Yep, there's a whole uh, itinerary. And on Facebook, there's an event, um, Pine Tree Riot 250th. Um, if you search on Facebook for that, you'll find it pretty easily. Do we have any hard copies we can put like, in the town office? Or? There's one in the library. A hard copy? Yeah. The, the, yeah. the itinerary's not, though. Um, we could probably hang some of those up. We have posters hanging up around town, but not of the agenda. So the whole, the whole event starts off at 10 o'clock, and it goes till about 2 o'clock, about four hours or so, four and a half hours. Um, and as Sue mentioned, Connie, so there's a play going on. I don't know if you've heard about this, but there's about 25 people in the play, roughly. Um, it's going to be held in the town hall, which is finally open again. And um, it's based on, on Connie's book, which is, I don't know if you've, if you've read it, it's a great novel, a novelette. Is that what you call yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And it's Novella. a little, it's a story of characters around the Pine Tree Ride event. So it fills in some of the personalities and some of the, the traits and you know it's a good it's a good great story you know if you were going to make a little movie out of it it's kind of the, the the text of a movie you know like a screenplay it's really fun so they cut it down to about an hour 45 minutes and uh yeah there's some small children playing oxen i guess or no <laughs> no? no no they're the mudgets <laughs> they're the mudgets <laughs> Uh, Neil, Neil gets to play the judge. So here, yeah. um, so there's Aaron the, Quimby is right here. Aaron, all right. Okay. John. So uh, there's a lot of people in here that, are, that have never, probably never acted before. Some have, but. 50 years ago. And the director is uh, Kenny, Kenny Cajal, is John, graduated from John Stark. And he went off to New York and he does production and set design and art design for like his resume is Netflix, TLC, he did the Forged in Fire series, he did all the artwork for that. He's a, he's basically a TV, you know, you know, t director type, and uh, he wanted to come home and, and do a play in the high school, and he kind of stumbled into this, um, they, well they kind of pulled he him in. He showed up just in time. Yeah. yeah, Lisa and Connie and others just grabbed him and, and he, he, he's, I think he went for a meeting and sat down and started doing auditions. He, he, we didn't I, ask. Yeah, and, 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 and he expected to just sit and chit chat about the project, and he ended up Thank doing the for two hours. So he's been great, and uh, you know he's he's running this as a as a professional project. And he's being I think he's being kind to the, to the amateurs that are working on here, but it's very well structured and, and disciplined, and they're practicing three days a week. And uh, dress rehearsals start next weekend in the town hall. And, uh, 
you know, it, it's going to be fun. It's really just going to be a great thing to watch. And uh, I, have, I haven't seen a full rehearsal myself yet, but I hear it's, I hear it's pretty fun. So. And we have a book, the booklet that people are going to get. Yeah, we, uh, Sue, Sue and I put together a 34-page booklet of, uh, you know, just a regular kind of handout. And it uh, has a lot of all the history in it, plus all of our sponsors' ads are in it. So businesses around town helped put this thing together. They contributed and donated money to, to make this possible. So it was, uh, it was a really great turnout of businesses. So. And the museum will be open from about 12 to 3? 12, 12, I think you said 12.30 to 3. The museum will be open for, you can go through and tour. And um, the plays are at 11.15 and 1.30. That's on the, when you see the agenda, you can see that. We also have the Sons of American Revolution coming. Um, and they're reenactor types, and they're going to do a couple of musket volleys and some march, not marching, but they're going to walk around. And, and they're, you know, New Hampshire 2nd and 3rd Regiment uh, Revolutionary War type. So that'll be fun as well. Any other questions or comments anybody wants to throw out? Well, I had a question with yeah. the markings on the tree. Was that symbolic of anything? That this the broad arrow? arrow? Yes. Yeah, the broad arrow was, was a tr common marking of the of the British crown as this is my property. So there are actually stones in New England on roads that, that, are, that have this carved in it. And there's buildings that have it in it as well. They had it sometimes whitewashed on buildings. But it meant, it meant the king's property. And that goes back to like the 1200s. So the broad arrow is an old symbol. It's easier for people that had to mark the tree so nobody else could take it down. It was easier to do it with that type of, uh, of a symbol. Yeah. It could easily be seen and easily done. Pretty easy to make, yeah. Just a couple of hatchet marks. I think that's actually going to happen in the play, too, from what I hear. So, a live tree in the play. Someone's going to, someone who plays John Sherburn is going to mark it, just like, just like it was done in the, in the day. So. Um, come take a look at the logs on your way out if you can. It's, it's just really interesting to see that, you know, to touch it. Um, so we're going to, you know, hopefully the weather's good. It should be, according to Neil. It's going to be a great day. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Are shirts available with jam or not? Oh, yeah. We have uh, a handful of, of this design, T-shirts and shirts. And then we have uh, the Historical Society has another shirt that has been going around for a few years with the pine tree ride in the back too. So if you're interested, there's uh, three or four out there and um, we have a couple left over for sale. And people who ordered shirts, some people are here for those, we have we have them here for you, the ones you ordered. So we can we can do that once we break up here. Thank you very much. Thank you all for Thank coming. Thank you.